This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 11 for December 5 to 11, The Christian and Work, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you for your word. We thank you that in the word we see Jesus and we find salvation because your Holy Spirit explains to us what your word is trying to teach us. And this week, as we look at how we relate to those around us and how we become productive in this world, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us personally and may our lives not only be changed for the better, but that they may be such that others will want to know the lovely Jesus too. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Let's read that again, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-eight. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Work is God's idea. In the ideal world before sin, God gave Adam and Eve the task of caring for the garden, as we read in Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Like their creator, in whose image they were made, they were to be employed in creative labour and loving service. That is, even in an unfallen world, a world without sin and death and suffering, humanity was to be at work. In this in-between time, after the ideal world and prior to the promised one, we are invited to view work as one of God's blessings. Among the Jews, every child was taught a trade. In fact, it was said that a father who didn't teach his son a trade would raise a criminal. Meanwhile, Jesus, the Son of God, spent many years doing his Father's will in honest labour as a skilled craftsman, perhaps providing people of Nazareth with needed furniture and agricultural implements. We read in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. This, too, was all part of the training to prepare him for the ministry ahead. The Apostle Paul was doing the Lord's work just as surely when he worked alongside Aquila and Priscilla for a year and a half as a tent maker, as he was on Sabbath debating in the synagogue, as he did so well in Acts 18 verses 1 to 4. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And Second Thessalonians 3, 8-12 to Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labour and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Now, even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. This week we will look at the whole question of work and its role in Christian education.
Sunday, December 6, The Many Sides of Work Ecclesiastes 3, verses 12 and 13 read, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Work. That's a solid Anglo-Saxon word with no frills. One syllable in English, yet it has many possible meanings. Out of necessity, we work to put food on our tables, pay the bills, and save a little for hard times. Losing a job is often worse than putting up with a poor work situation. Work can give a person a sense of worth. Work is a common way to answer the question, What do you do? Or even, What are you? Most retirees continue to work part-time as long and as they are able, whether for pay or as a volunteer. A job offers a reason for getting up in the morning, gives a teenager a job, and there's one fewer candidate for delinquency. Question. Read Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. What is the context here, and what does it say to us about another side of work, at least for some. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Suddenly the work given before the fall changes after the fall. Here is reference to another side of work. For some, work means only the drudgery of daily toil, which will end with death. They labour on in jobs that they despise, hoping to retire while they still have their health. For others, work can even take over one's life, becoming the centre of one's existence, even the all-encompassing source of one's personal identity. Away from their work, these people feel depressed or disoriented, unsure of what to do or where to turn. In retirement, they may fall apart physically and psychologically and often die prematurely. Christians need to learn how to work God's way. Work is more than an economic necessity. Man is more than just an employee. Rightly understood, one's life work is an avenue of ministry, an expression of one's relationship to the Lord. Part of the teacher's task is helping students find the work where their skills and God-given interests intersect with the needs of the world. And so to finish the day, what do you do? That is, what are you doing with your life and how can you better glorify the Lord by doing it? Monday, December 7, Work and Nurture Vocation or work deals with the doingness of life. Even those with the most cerebral of jobs end up in some way doing physical labour of some sort, even if it means merely pushing computer keys. Question, what the following texts teach us about work using hands as a symbol. Deuteronomy 16 verse 15. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you surely rejoice. And Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Proverbs 21 verse 25, the desire of the lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Jeremiah 1 verse 16, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. God has given us the work of our hands so that we can find fulfilment and joy, as we read in Proverbs 10 verse 4, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. 
And Proverbs 12, verse 14, A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. In psychology, self-efficacy describes the belief that every person has the ability to accomplish something meaningful in life. Self-efficacy is not increased by repeating, I think I can, I think I can. Only actually doing something increases self-efficacy. While the work of our hands is God's blessing to us, as we read in Psalm 90 verse 17, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us, yes, establish the work of our hands, and allows us to live a meaningful life, God's ultimate plan is that the work of your hands would bless others. Paul writes that we must work doing something useful with our hands so that we may have something to share with others. Paul surely lived by that principle. As we read in Acts 20 verses 34 to 35, You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Nehemiah's simple prayer should be ours. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah 6 verse 9. So to finish today, what is your attitude toward your work? What ways might you be able to use your work to be more of a blessing to others? Tuesday, December 8, Work and Excellence Question. Skim over Exodus 20, verse 10, through to chapter 30, verse 38. How particular was God when he asked Moses to erect a tabernacle of worship? What does this tell us about God's character? That's six whole chapters almost. Let's begin at Exodus 25, verse 10. It's titled, The Ark of the Testimony. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out, you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a moulding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them on its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece, with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And then There was the instructions for the table for the showbread, and then the gold lampstand, and then the tabernacle itself. And that goes on and on, and then we come on to the altar of burnt offering in chapter 27. You shall make an altar of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. And the description continues until we come to the court of the tabernacle. And then there are details for that as well. And then there's the care of the lampstand. And then the garments for the priesthood in chapter 28, the ephod, the breastplate. 
the other priestly garments. And Aaron and his sons were consecrated in chapter 29. And that's a long chapter with lots of details about how it was to occur. And then the daily offerings um, in verse 38 of chapter 28. And that carries on till we come to the altar of incense in chapter 30. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And there's a lot more detail there. Then there's the ransom money. And after that, the bronze laver and the holy anointing oil and the incense. Until we come to verse 30 up. Eight. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. When God told Moses to build a tent for him, Moses could have said, No problem, Lord, I've been pitching tents ever since I ran away from Egypt forty years ago. Just give me a minute. For any man living in the semi nomadic Midianite culture of the day, putting up a tent was simple stuff. He could have done it blindfolded, reflex only, with his mind on other, far more important things. What Moses may not have expected was a very detailed set of blueprints for an otherwise very simple architectural structure, plus a long how-to-do list regarding every piece of furniture inside, as well as for the priestly garments. Nearly 150 point-by-point instructions to build a simple table. Moses had to follow a seven-step assembly procedure in uh, chapter 25, verses 23 to 30. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a moulding of gold all around. And you shall make for it a frame of a hand breadth all around. And you shall make a gold moulding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. <coughs> the rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table, and you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. The attention to detail that God showed in the building of his tent, as well as later on in the instructions for the sacrificial rituals, shows a prevailing spirit of excellence, a desire to produce nothing less than a masterpiece. The materials were of the highest quality, the design was impeccable, the work had to be outstanding, the message was clear. With God, sloppy work is not accepted. However, Although the standard appeared to be high, it was God himself who provided not only the impetus, but also the human resources for reaching it. We read in Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 to 6, and chapter 35, verses 30 to 36, verse 1, that God himself gave the people the needed skills. These men were filled with the Spirit, giving them ability and knowledge of all kinds of craftsmanship, so that the building of the tabernacle and its furniture would proceed as the Lord has commanded, Exodus 36 verse 1. Moreover, the same two master designers also were endowed with the ability to teach, as we read in Exodus 35 verse 34, so that their knowledge and skill could continue to abide within the Israelite community. Although these two individuals are singled out in the story as being the leaders chosen by God, other people received similar gifts and joined the work, as we read in chapter 36 and verse 2. Then Moses called Bezalel and Oliab, and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, every one whose heart was stirred, to come and do the work. Thus, being fallen, sinful humans is not a valid excuse for treating any task with anything less than utmost dedication. God expects us always to perform at our best, putting our talents, skills, time and education to good use for great causes.
Wednesday, December 9, Work and Spirituality If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, we read in Galatians 5.25. One's work and spirituality are inseparable. Christianity is not a garment that can be put on or taken off as one changes moods or passes through different phases of life. Instead, Christianity creates a new being who manifests himself or herself in every dimension of life, including work. Question. Read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. Which gifts that Paul describes also describe you and your work? Galatians 5, beginning at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words describes the spiritual person as one who manifests the fruits of the Spirit in his own way. From this, we may conclude that through our connection with Christ, we human beings will function as believers in all aspects of our lives. A patient lay dying at Florida Hospital, an Adventist institution, as his closest friend kept a vigil at his bedside. Nurses moved in and out of the room caring for the patient's needs. Seeking to keep the conversation moving, the friend asked the nurses where they had their training. Many had said that they were educated at Florida Hospital College. This made a big impression on the friend. He then subsequently made several visits to Florida Hospital College to see what it was like. Why? Because he had told people that the nurses trained at this school seemed to him to constantly give more tender loving care to his dying friend than did those nurses who had been trained somewhere else. That is, he was able to see a big difference between them and others in regard to their attitude toward his dying friend. Thus, he asked many questions about the college and its mission, and eventually he left a gift of $100,000 to educate more nurses, such as those he had seen in action. Yes, spirituality is a way of life. So to finish today, how do you manifest your own spirituality in the day-to-day tasks of your life? What kind of impression do you think that you make? Because, in the end... You do make an impression. Thursday, December 10, Work and Stewardship Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. The wisest of men use these words of counsel regarding stewardship in every aspect of life. When asked to comment on Christian stewardship, many confine their thoughts to the Christian fiscal responsibility. Although money is certainly an important aspect of stewardship, to limit it to money alone is much too narrow. In organizational theory, stewardship refers to management's responsibility to develop and utilize properly all available resources. In the church, what are the resources with which God has blessed us? Peter clearly states that every person has gifts endowed by the Creator, and he refers to such endowed Christians as a holy priesthood, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, with responsibility to God for their stewardship of all of God's gifts, money, time, energy, talent, and others. Question. Read Ecclesiastes 9.10 and 1 Corinthians 10.31. What is the message to us in these verses about how we should work and how we should educate people to work? Ecclesiastes 9.10 again, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, 
for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. One of the common pitfalls of life today is the tendency to compartmentalise the different aspects of living. There is one's work life, one's family life, one's spiritual life, and even one's leisure life. The tendency to separate these areas of life so that there is little or no crossover between them is to be desired in some instances. For example, it is not good to bring home one's work so that that interferes with family responsibilities. Neither should the pursuit of leisure curtail the time we spend with God. However, such restriction should not apply to the role our spiritual life must play in all of our existence. The Christian's work grows out of fellowship and work with God. Work is one way by which we can practice the presence of God. To compartmentalise our religious life, to limit God to one day, one hour, or even just one area of living, is to reject the weary presence of God in these other areas. And so to finish today, two questions. First, ask yourself if you do indeed compartmentalise your spiritual life. Second, if you do, how can you learn to let spirituality reign in all that you do? Friday, December 11. Work, a curse or a blessing? It seemed to come as part of the curse of sin in Genesis 3.17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. A closer reading reveals it was the ground that was cursed and not the work. Ellen G. White states that God intended this commission to work as a blessing, as she writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60. The life of toil and care, which was henceforth to be man's lot, was appointed in love. It was a discipline rendered needful by his sin, to place a check upon the indulgence of appetite and passion, to develop habits of self-control. It was a part of God's great plan for man's recovery from the ruin and degradation of sin. End of quote. Might we perhaps have made it a curse through monotony, overwork, or overvaluing its role in our lives? Whatever our situation, we must learn to put work in its proper perspective, and Christian education must help train people to learn the value of work, while at the same time not making an idol out of it. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Read Ecclesiastes 2, 18-24. How can Solomon consider work both a blessing and a curse in the same section of the Bible? Beginning at verse 18 in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Then I hated all my labour in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will rule over all my labour in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labour in which I had toiled under the sun. For the heir is a man whose labour is with wisdom and knowledge and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not laboured for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what has man for all his labour, and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful, and his work burdensome, even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labour. This also, I saw, was from the hand of God. What are hints in the text about 
what can make the difference in how we approach our work. Two, it is through work that we care for, that's nurture, our families. How can we pass on a positive attitude about work to our families? Three, the line between doing an excellent job and being a workaholic is sometimes a fine one. How do we keep from crossing the line? Ecclesiastes 2.23 gave us a clue, for all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. And question four. Paul stated very clearly in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If any one will not work, neither shall he eat. This principle, of course, makes great sense. What might be some examples where it doesn't apply? That is, why must we be sure not to make this an ironclad rule that must never be broken? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Great Hope in a Doctor's Office and it's by Andrew McChesney. A series of major life changes troubled Helene Ebora in Paris, France. After raising two children, she lost her mother. Wishing to do something new in her life, she took a job at a luxury store. But then she suffered a leg ailment that required surgery. After the operation, she had to visit a physician regularly for foot examinations. During one of those visits, she saw a small book lying on the table in the physician's waiting room. Its title, The Great Hope, seemed to be calling out to her. This is just what I need, Helene thought. Back at home, Helene read The Great Hope from cover to cover that same day. She was fascinated with the story about Earth's last days and the second coming of Jesus. She decided that it was not by chance that she had stumbled across the book in the physician's office. She saw a note in The Great Hope saying it was an excerpt from a bigger book called The Great Controversy and inviting her to send away for the full volume. She went online and ordered Ellen White's The Great Controversy. Also in the book, she saw the words Seventh-day Adventist Church. She was not familiar with the denomination, but then she remembered that she had a late grandmother who had become an Adventist in her old age. They had never met. Elaine decided to read the Bible text. After reading this book, I absolutely must read the Bible now, she thought. She had many questions about her life, but she didn't know where to look for answers in the Bible. She didn't feel qualified or knowledgeable. Then she remembered that her grandmother had become an Adventist after studying the Bible with an Adventist pastor. She needed to find an Adventist pastor. Going online, she found an Adventist church and began twice-a-week Bible studies with its pastor. As the months passed, she learned about the Seventh-day Sabbath and baptism by immersion. She and her husband were baptised. Helene has no idea who left the great hope at her physician's office, but she knows it wasn't the physician who wasn't an Adventist. Today, she leaves copies of the great hope in physician's offices across Paris. I am very grateful that I came across the book, said Helene, aged 56. I am convinced that it was no accident. My self-esteem has grown, and I have more to learn as I study the Bible and Ellen White's writings. God had a plan. I love my church. And there's a photograph here on the left of Helene with her blonde hair and her tortoiseshell rimmed glasses, smiling beautifully. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the gospel through literature and other means. And while we're there, I'd like to send out a a hello to the Hope Vision Fellowship in Toronto in Canada, a a group who mostly are vision impaired, and particularly to Pat and uh, to Nina and Fargo, her dog, and her husband, Kevin, not necessarily in any particular order. It was good to see you on the uh, video from the Adventist World Mission promoting the Sabbath School offerings. 
May God bless you in your fellowship together in that beautiful little church in Toronto. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.